executive plans. If we're going to build pipelines in the United States, the pipe should be made in the United States. President Donald Trump continues his campaign promise by using executive action. Pro-life progress, a busy week on Capitol Hill where lawmakers discuss making the Hyde Amendment permanent. Undercover investigation. Uh, we actually don't offer uh, prenatal services. The pro-life group Live Action releases a new video attempting to expose Planned Parenthood again. And Marching for Life, we're three days from the world's largest pro-life demonstration. The president of the march joins us for updates and last-minute preparations on EWTN News Nightly for Tuesday, January 24th, 2017. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you to those of you joining us from around the world for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Lauren Ashburn. A battle on Capitol Hill over abortion and whether it should be funded by the government. Lawmakers tangled today in just one of several pro-life bills gaining traction. Capitol Hill correspondent Jason Calvi is on the Hill with the fierce fight. Jason. Lauren, the Hyde Amendment bans U.S. funds for most abortions. It dates back to 1976 and is attached to spending bills each year. Today, lawmakers debated the measure, sometimes passionately. What about the other right to choose? The right of the taxpayer to choose not to pay for the practice that violates everything that they believe. Democrats and Republicans clash over a crucial pro-life bill. The bill today, H.R. 7, is a dramatic overreach. Choices about women's health care should be made between a woman and her doctor. Abortion care? Abortion isn't care and abortion services. It is taking a life. The bill would make the Hyde Amendment permanent, banning taxpayer funds for abortion. It's named after late Illinois Congressman Henry Hyde. I knew the great Henry Hyde. He was one of the most... Uh, eloquent champions of uh, protecting innocent human life that ever stepped through these doors. For the first time, the 2016 Democratic platform called for the repeal of the amendment. Representative King, God bless you and thank you for bringing this bill to the floor. But Republicans took control of the White House and Congress, putting them in the driver's seat to protect life at all stages. These are the voiceless that can't defend themselves. And if you notice uh, throughout history and society, um, if, if you have a segment of society that is not able to scream for their own mercy, usually they get pushed to the back of the line. And we need to defend the voiceless. And there are more bills in the pipeline with that goal. The heartbeat bill would ban abortions after the baby's heartbeat can be detected. We need to do right for the babies. Uh, we need to make America safe again for pre-born children. Ohio pro-life leader Janet Porter helped draft the bill. We should be doing better than regulating around the edges of abortion, debating whether or not we fund it. It's time we actually bring the killing to an end. And this bill will, will take an enormous step in that direction. Heartbeat bans have been struck down in Arkansas and North Dakota. Ohio, Ohio's Republican governor, John Kasich, vetoed it. He said he was worried it, too, would be struck down. Lauren? Do these pro-life bills have public support, Jason? Well, a brand new Marist poll commissioned by the Knights of Columbus finds that six out of ten Americans oppose taxpayer money going to support abortions. Okay, Jason Calvi on Capitol Hill. Thank you, Jason. Congressman Chris Smith, a Republican from New Jersey, is the co-chair of the Pro-Life Caucus and joins us now. He's also a sponsor of the bill to make the Hyde Amendment permanent. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Lauren, very much. This would be a big, big win for pro-life advocates, but do you think you're going to get the votes you need in the Senate to pass it? Uh, I believe it is a very real possibility. My hope is that Mitch McConnell uh, will allow just a simple majority, not a 60-vote uh, prerequisite to, get, to pass the bill. Uh, we already have a statement of administration policy that came out today from the Trump administration that if he gets the bill, he will sign it immediately, which is just the opposite of what we news, got from Barack right. Obama uh, when it passed last Congress. It is great news. And, um, you know, the um, Hyde Amendment has saved, as you know, and the empirical data shows it, over 2 million 
children are living today, and some are adults because it's been in effect for 40 years because of the Hyde Amendment. And then if you add all the other abortion riders, you know, no funding for, uh, it has increased uh, the number of saved individuals uh, who don't get abortions because the money's not there to pay for it. So overall, in his first week, how would you say Donald Trump is doing on the pro-life front? He has been magnificent. Uh, it is polar opposite of Barack Obama and Bill Clinton before him and what Hillary Clinton had envisioned. You know, interesting enough, Hillary Clinton had said that one of the first things she would do if elected would be to eradicate the Hyde Amendment. It probably would have happened through her Supreme Court pick uh, in a five to four decision. That's not going to happen. Uh, thankfully, she was an existential threat to the unborn domestically and internationally. We are finally seeing the, just the opposite. The Mexico City policy for the 21st century that was promulgated yesterday by uh, President Trump uh, goes after those abortionists who are trying to eviscerate pro-life laws all over the world, all over particularly the world. in Africa, right. Latin America, uh, with taxpayer funding. What do you say to critics who say this will unfairly harm low-income women who depend on the government for health care services? Well, abortion is not health care. Uh, it cures, unless you construe an unborn child to be a cancer or a tumor, uh, it, is, it is very, very, you know, it hurts the woman and destroys the baby. It is not health care. And what about people who believe the number of abortions is down because of access to contraception that Planned Parenthood provides? I believe that the data will bear this out because we have had, you can go to any CVS and get contraception. It is widely available, was before, is now. Uh, the game changer has been the state laws and the lack of funding uh, at the state, not all states, but and certainly at the federal level. Representative Chris Smith, Republican from New Jersey, thank you for joining us. Lauren, thank you so much. President Trump says he'll announce his Supreme Court candidate next week. It's the reason many conservative Americans voted for him, especially pro-life Catholics. But that was just one nugget we learned on a busy day at the White House. President Donald Trump fulfills more campaign promises today. Keystone Pipeline. With a focus on jobs and the U.S. economy. Trump cleared the way for construction of the Keystone and Dakota Access oil pipelines with two executive orders. President Obama stopped the transport of oil across the country for environmental concerns. But after the death of Justice Antonin Scalia in February 2016, the Supreme Court is on the minds of many pro-life Americans. We will pick a truly great Supreme Court justice, but I'll be announcing it sometime next week. Elsewhere in the nation's capital, the Trump cabinet continues to take shape. Several nominees were approved today, including Elaine Chao as Transportation Secretary, Wilbur Ross as head of the Commerce Department, Governor Nikki Haley as the next ambassador to the United Nations, and Dr. Ben Carson as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. Looking beyond next week, Speaker Paul Ryan has invited Donald Trump to address a joint session of Congress on February 28th. This will be an opportunity for the people and their representatives to hear directly from our new president about his vision and our shared agenda. Also today, Trump met with the big three automakers, GM, Ford, and Fiat Chrysler. He says his administration will go down as one of the most friendly for business. Representative Tom Price, Donald Trump's pick to lead the Department of Health and Human Services, faced a testy Senate panel today. Democrats challenged the Republican from Georgia over his support for dismantling Obamacare. Under the executive order, will you commit that no one will be worse off? What I commit to, Senator, is working with you and every single member of Congress to make certain that we have the highest quality health care and that every single American has access to affordable coverage. The timing of Price's confirmation is critical because Trump has said Republicans will release a plan to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act as soon as Price is confirmed. The congressman is a veteran conservative and orthopedic surgeon. The newly confirmed Defense Secretary James Mad Dog Mattis isn't wasting any time crafting a plan to defeat ISIS. The former general will map out a strategy when President Trump visits the Pentagon Friday. Wyatt Goolsby joins us from the White House, where the president is also meeting with his newly confirmed CIA director. Wyatt. 
Lauren, President Trump wants to make clear that all 17 intelligence agencies, as well as the military, are on the same page with one goal, to defeat ISIS. He says that he's willing to work with anyone, including Russia, to do that. But some question if that's a good idea. So help me God. So help me God. After a late night swearing in, the new CIA director, Mike Pompeo, meets today with the president. White House officials say the president is on the same page as the former Kansas congressman when it comes to ISIS. The greatest threats to America have always been the CIA's top priorities. Secretary Pompeo said during a confirmation hearing that ISIS presents the most complicated threat environment the United States has seen in recent memory. President Trump agrees. We have to get rid of ISIS. We have to get rid of ISIS. We have no choice. Trump and Pompeo told the intelligence community at the CIA this weekend they have their full support. So it's going to be a multi-layered uh, effort. Coley Stimson, an expert on national security from the Heritage Foundation, says the fight against ISIS will require uncomfortable partnerships, and Russia tops that list. I think you have essentially two options, not working with them and not trusting them, or working with them and seeing where you can trust them. And I think the Trump administration has taken the latter view. Now, Mike Pompeo was just confirmed as CIA director last night after a Senate vote. So at this point, we are still awaiting to hear what his official first moves will be. Lauren? Wyatt, not everyone in the new administration seems to take the same view of Russia. Is that correct? Yes, even the new U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley, you had mentioned her before, she has made it absolutely clear, at least during some of her hearings, that Russia is not to be trusted. Even Mike Pompeo had brought up Russia and hacking and, and his mistrust of Russia during some of his hearings. Now, again, that was during the earlier hearings. It doesn't mean they're not willing to work with Trump on the issue, but clearly trust in Russia is going to be, have to be something they're going to have to work through. Lauren? Okay, Wyatt Goolsby, White House correspondent. Thank you, Wyatt. Other stories our EWTN News Nightly team is covering in today's world. A possible delay to Brexit. Britain's government must get approval from Parliament before leaving the European Union. The ruling doesn't mean Britain will remain in the EU, but it could delay Prime Minister Theresa May's plan to trigger negotiations by the end of March. Russia, Iran and Turkey promise to safeguard Syria's ceasefire and ensure no one breaks the deal. The three countries are sponsoring peace talks in Kazakhstan between Syria and rebel factions. A truce has been in place for almost a month. Another tragedy strikes central Italy days after earthquakes and avalanches. A helicopter crashes, killing six people on board. The chopper was carrying an injured skier when it smashed into the snow. Poor visibility slowed rescue crews who brought the victims' bodies down in sleds to waiting vehicles. Pope Francis has a message for journalists, convey hope and trust. It's part of his message for the World Day of Communications presented in the Vatican today. The head of Vatican Communications says journalists need to break the cycle of bad news, not denying that evil exists, but showing that it does not have the final word. The message was released today on the feast of St. Francis de Sales, patron saint of journalists. Delia Gallagher, Vatican correspondent for CNN, was at the Vatican's presentation today and joins us from Rome. Delia, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Lauren. You have covered three popes from John Paul II, Benedict XVI, and now Pope Francis. How do you see the Vatican's communication changing? Is it improving under this pontificate? Well, Lauren, I would say that, you know, Pope Francis, one of the kind of distinguishing things about him is his very conversational style. And I think this is one of the things that people find endearing about him. Um, from a journalist perspective, I can tell you that, it, in a sense, it doubles our work. Because, you know, I'm thinking of, for example, on the papal flights, when he gives the infamous papal interview. Um, you know, he tends to digress. He likes to tell stories. And so when you ask him a question uh, and you're taking the dictation of what he's saying, you know, you'll find a lot of ellipses and trying to follow back and forth from all of the different stories that he likes to recount. And you try and get to sort of, well, what's the answer to the question? You know, and if we compare that to Pope Emeritus Benedict, for example, who sort of spoke in complete uh, paragraphs right. each time, it's a, it's a huge difference in terms of communication styles, and I think it's one of those things um, that also creates uh, a certain amount of, of perplexity for some people when they look at Pope Francis and say, okay, where is he going? Who right, is he? What right. does he want to do? Um, and trying to find those kind of very um, easy, 
easily formulated and definitive answers um, are, are sometimes a bit more difficult yes. from him. Let's talk yeah. about um, what happened today. He said we should not just focus on bad news, but find a healthy balance in our news coverage. That is very hard to do. Well, it is, um, except that I think we do do it. You know, I think we do give good news. Uh, certainly, um, the cable news, the nightly broadcasts in the United States always try to leave some room for a good story, um, a good news story. And I think it's right that the Pope reminds us of the need for that. At the same time, of course, underneath that is also the very important point that journalists, in the first instance, need to report accurately and need to try to get to the truth. Even when we can't get the big truth, at least we have precision in our storytelling and accuracy in our facts. It's a big debate right now in the United States, and it's something that we're reminded of right. over here again with the Pope's message that good news sure. or bad news, really our first focus has to be on uh, getting our facts right. And, and then, of course, the credibility uh, from people who are watching us or reading us uh, to believe those facts. All right, Delia Gallagher, Vatican correspondent for CNN. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Coming up, a new undercover investigation. We don't see pregnant women as a way of giving prenatal care. What it reveals about Planned Parenthood. The pro-life group Live Action released an investigative video today. It says it proves Planned Parenthood centers do not offer prenatal care. Joining us now is the founder and president of Live Action, Lila Rose. Welcome back to the program. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. Tell us about this investigation. Of course. So Live Action started to investigate Planned Parenthood's so-called health services with our mammogram investigation a few years ago, showing they provide no mammograms. And right now it's hotly contested that they should get taxpayer money because they're so essential to women's health care. So, so we you, wanted to unpack that. So what did you do? You called 97 centers mm -hmm. and then what? So 41 affiliates, 97 centers in clinic and and over the phone basically saying look we're pregnant can we get prenatal care? All right let's and take a look at, at what you found. Let's go ahead and listen to this. Unfortunately, no, we wouldn't provide any pre type of prenatal services here at Planned Parenthood. We're not a prenatal care provider. No Planned Parenthood does prenatal care. We don't offer prenatal care at Planned Parenthood. We specialize in abortions, you know, that's what our ultrasounds are for. So what did you make out of all of that? Basically, despite advertising it on their websites, despite advertising it on their Twitter, TV, Planned Parenthood president going out and saying, we need, we need taxpayer money because of prenatal care, they're lying. That out of the 97 facilities we called, all of them, none of them provided prenatal care, except five said they could refer for it or that they could take some clients, but it was negligible. The vast majority, 92, said, we do not provide prenatal care. We're an abortion provider, and we admit the name is deceiving. They even would admit that to Planned Parenthood. Exactly. You're not trying exactly to plan that. that. We understand that in our marketing, it appears that we are for prenatal care and we can provide these health services to women, but the reality is that we don't. So what services other than abortion do they provide? So plan Planned Parenthood has t been touting that they are the premier women's health care provider in this country. When you actually unpack their services, you find that while they're doing a third of abortions in this country every year, they're doing less than 2% of annual breast exams, manual breast exams. Less than 2% across the country. For all women in our country mm -hmm. of reproductive age, and less than 1% of the nation's pap smear tests, which is incredible Then, when you compare that to they're doing a third of abortions in this country. So they're doing this entire push for taxpayer funds, saying we are essential, women are going to be without all these services, yet they serve a, a tiny percentage of women. And meanwhile, there's 13,000 federally qualified health centers that are not performing abortions, that are not that an abortion could provide these services. That's exactly. your point. Now, exactly. we heard Jason earlier talking about um, this defunding and the Hyde Amendment. What did you learn about Planned Parenthood's strategy? Planned Parenthood has been really terrified of the day then that President Trump takes office because they had a best friend in President Obama. Their funding increased. They're making a half a billion dollars under President Obama a year from taxpayers. And Trump, before becoming president, pledged to be pro-life and to not force taxpayers. And to defund. Exactly. So now that is on the table because there's a reconciliation spending bill that might be signed to defund Planned Parenthood. That and, day has finally come. And Planned Parenthood. 
uh, is going to be fighting that tooth and nail. Tooth and, and we, nail. we will be talking to you about that in the future. Lila Rose, founder and president of Live Action, thank you so thank much you. for joining us. Pope Francis confirms a new leader for Opus Dei, a lay institution that helps people seek holiness in everyday life. Y la única persona que en fondo, en fondo, en última instancia, el encuentro con Jesucristo. Monsignor Fernando Ocariz Braña says his desire is for Opus Dei, which means work of God in Latin, to continue to serve the church and the world. He tells us he's most interested in the good of souls and helping them encounter Jesus Christ. Opus Dei was founded by Saint Jose Maria Escriva in Spain in 1928. It now has about 90,000 members worldwide, and the majority are all lay people. The group began its work here in the United States in 1949. Up next, Speaker Paul Ryan leads the call for more school choice. Could it impact Catholic education? And surviving abortion. It's a love story, right? It's, it's a love story that, that God wrote. One woman's story and her fight to protect children in the womb. It's National School Choice Week, and hundreds of students joined members of Congress, including the House Speaker, for a rally at the Capitol. Why would we limit a person to a certain school in a certain zip code if that school is failing you? That's just wrong. Like if I go to a school that I don't necessarily prefer, I'm not going to be as motivated or inspired to do my work and put my best foot forward in everything I do. Today's rally was one of more than 20,000 events held across the country. School Choice would let students use vouchers in more private schools, including Catholic ones. Abortion survivors have their own bill, and two congressmen are making sure it's getting attention. Senator James Lankford of Oklahoma and Representative Trent Franks of Arizona made an appeal for babies who survive an abortion attempt. The bill provides punishments for surgeons who kill a child who survives that abortion. This is not about abortion. This is about a child that has been delivered now that everyone is looking at and can see physically uh, now on the table. And it would only seem right that this child receives medical care. Lawmakers say the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act would criminally prosecute for murder anyone who commits an act that kills a child born alive. Melissa Odin is an abortion survivor. She didn't find out until she was 14 years old, and that news devastated her. The Catholic convert is now a pro-life advocate. She recently met her birth mother for the first time in what she says is a life-changing experience. After everything I've gone through in my life and, and my healing from it, uh, my tears are not tears of pain. My tears are just tears of incredible gratitude. You can see more of Melissa Odin's personal story during the premiere of EWTN's Pro-Life Weekly. The show is designed to shine the light of truth on issues like abortion and assisted suicide. It airs Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. Joining us now is Jeannie Mancini, president of March for Life, which takes place in... Three days. Three days. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's a short period of time. Yep. What is the difference between last year and this year in terms of interest in the march? Well, last year, you'll remember that there was a blizzard that was forecast, <laughs> oh, so right. there was so much that's talk right. about the blizzard, and is the march still going to go on, and this, that, and the other. That's but right. in addition to that, you know, we have a new president here in Washington, D.C., and oh, everybody... Oh, do, we do. I think his name is Donald Trump. That's right. <laughs> You've heard of him. Everybody's very excited about his promises to the pro-life community, about his promises to enact good pro-life legislation. And he's already doing it. He's already we reported at that yeah. at the so top the, of the show. Right. So the enthusiasm is, is palpable. I and mean, the it White House has also mentioned this march. The, three times in the course of the last couple of days, Kellyanne Conway, who's one of our speakers yes. at the March for Life, and then Sean Spicer mentioned it in a, in a press conference earlier today. So that's very exciting. We typically only are labeled the anti-abortion rally from the White House, and it's exciting to be really talked about as the March for Life and media report on the March for Life. What does that mean for media coverage? What are you seeing? Uh, we're seeing a huge uptick in media coverage. So right before I came over, I was on the phone with NPR. Before that, NBC Nightly News. Before that, the New York Times. So outlets that, you know, sometimes report on the march but aren't typically that friendly 
towards the march have been calling and we've been having sort of in-depth conversations and it's been a great opportunity. Talk about the Women's March very briefly versus yeah. this march. I think that some pro-life groups, as we've reported, were shut out of that march. They were, which is unfortunate. I, the Women's March, um, it's really confusing about what that was really about and what the goals were. So I myself planned on marching until they said they were specifically pro-choice. Right. I just feel terrible for the young women who were there who didn't get to hear the truth about life. So there's so much to be said on that. Um, we've seen some women who are angry because their voices weren't represented at the Women's March respond by um, by, by calling the you? March for Life. Yeah, saying, we had all right, to we're marching. Call in volunteers to answer That's all of great. the emails, all of the calls because we we can't handle it. This is it. so different. I remember covering this. <clears throat> this is so different from last year. We can't wait to talk to you at the end of the week. I know you're speaking at the Washington Monument, which is the command central for the march. Jeannie Mancini, president of March for Life. Thanks, Thanks for having me, Lauren. Thanks for being here. And from all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, to all of you around the world, I'm Lauren Ashburn. Don't forget, you can see every broadcast of the show on EWTN's YouTube channel. I'll see you again tomorrow. Good night and God bless.